You can just say consult a licensed tax professional or legal professional. There's no official guidance on the vast majority of the topics that we are going to discuss. Every person's situation is different, and we're just speaking in general terms. So I don't know what's the best way to say that, but... Oh, I'm just using that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay. Hello, welcome to episode 53 of The Bitcoin Game. I'm Rob Mitchell. In this episode, I speak to Zach McClure of Token Tax in what I feel is one of the more in-depth cryptocurrency tax discussions I've ever heard on a podcast. This is mostly beyond the basic stuff as we discuss everything from like-kind cryptocurrency exchanges to the idea of selecting specific cost basis cryptocurrency when giving a gift. We also cover some of the features of Token Tax, Zach's new service to help people manage cryptocurrency taxes. Here we go. Hello. Hey, Rob. Hey, thanks for coming on the Bitcoin game. Sure. A listener who uses Token Tax, your platform uh, is Optic Top. Oh, man, it's a tongue twister. (laughs) Optic Topic. I'd mentioned something about taxes and he's like, oh, you should have Token Tax on your show. And at first I was like, oh, it sounds like a ICO. (laughs) I was glad it wasn't. Unfortunately for us, Facebook also thought we were an ICO. For a while, so. Oh, wow. But now we're approved, so they finally, we finally got through to them. But yeah, we, uh, the name is, it has a nice ring to it, but it is often confused for an ICO, so it's one of those trade-off situations. I guess first off, before we get into Bitcoin and taxes and everything, uh, can you tell me anything about your background? Yeah, happy to. So, been investing in crypto for a couple of years. And I had a background in accounting, finance, consulting. I had a bit of a, an eclectic past. So I spent a couple of years doing investment banking. And then I went and uh, joined Teach for America and taught math and got really into entrepreneurship teaching, personal finance teaching, teaching the investment game. Um, so I've always had a background like doing my own taxes and different complicated investment tax situations. And I spent, as you noticed on my on my Skype handle, I spent the summers while I was a teacher working for nonprofits in India and Africa, helping them with their legal structure and financial projections and basically financial record keeping. And then I, I came back to the U.S. I went to business school and then worked as a consultant for a couple of years. And then as I was investing in crypto last year, I just saw that 2017 was going to be the perfect storm for crypto taxes because the vast majority of people had only started investing in 2017. So there's going to be a lot of short-term gains, first of all, or for four reasons, I guess. The second one is because of altcoins. The only way to buy most of them was Bitcoin to altcoin, which is a taxable event or a major coin to altcoin. Um, Huge price increases. So the gains were going to be definitely on the IRS radar. And just so much price volatility meant that if you use specific shares accounting as opposed to FIFO and LIFO accounting, the tax savings could be enormous, especially for an active trader. Um, so as I saw this happening, I was like, how can I help people in the space, one, file their taxes and figure it out? And uh, that's how, that's, that was the genesis story of Token Tax. I met my partner who's a, a web designer and backend developer, and we created this tool together. There's some similar services that have been around. Were you thinking you had something more to offer or just there's room for more competition? Or Yeah, we took a look around the ecosystem. And, you know, just in the past couple of months, a lot of different products have popped up. But the existing options just left a lot to be desired for different reasons. You know, um, they were either they had cool accounting functionality, but you almost had to be an accountant to use it correctly. And, you know, getting all your trades, getting all your info in there is very, can be very difficult. And if you make one mistake on cost basis or you forget to enter or you enter one trade incorrectly, you know, your, your taxes could be off by thousands of dollars. And, you know, for, you know, very sophisticated users, those tools are great and enough. But I wanted to create something that was more like a hand-holding we, we automate checking for a lot of the common pitfalls like missing cost basis and, oh, did you, did you buy an ICO or whatever? So it's more like taking the best of the existing tools and then adding this tax minimization um, specific shares accounting algorithm on top of that because we take it a step further than, you know, even HIFO, LIFO, FIFO. 
because we actually factor in a user's income, the place where they're filing, their state of filing, whether they're single or married, to get their exact long-term gain, capital gain tax rate and short-term gain capital tax, or short-term capital gain tax rate, I'm sorry, and basically figure out the break-even point. And just like very simple math, if a user's short-term ordinary income rate is 30% and their long-term gain rate is 15%, it means that a $1,000 long-term gain will feel the same to them as a $500 short-term gain at a, at a very simple level because the tax rate is twice as high for ordinary income. So we use those break-evens to get like the true minimized taxes for 2017. And that didn't exist and still doesn't exist. We're the only ones that have that. So that was basically the differentiating factors. So I'm trying to go by memory. Um, is there something called specified shares or specified lots or something like that? Is that yeah? Is that similar or all accounting is specified shares? So to speak, like FIFO, LIFO, they're also specific shares. It's basically which shares are you selling? Um, the thing about FIFO is that it's just easiest to track because it's whichever whichever shares had the the oldest date, and LIFO is also easier easy to track because it's whichever shares had the newest date. Um, and so for traditional accountants, you know, they, they've done a great job doing what they can do to file people's crypto taxes, but for them, you know, they're getting paid a flat fee to do someone's taxes. It's very difficult from a record keeping perspective to do specific shares accounting to minimize taxes. And it's not like they're getting paid a commission for the money they save their users by reducing their tax liability in that year. You know, they're just trying to get it done as quickly as possible and have a clean record keeping so it's easier for them in the future. And it makes sense for stocks and bonds that haven't gone up as much because the main thing for those is that you get long-term capital gain treatment, which is why FIFO is traditionally used over LIFO. Because LIFO, you're selling the most recent one. If you're reinvesting dividends every three months, like you would if you owned Apple stock, for example, you don't want to sell your most recent purchases because they'll be taxed at short-term rates. So you sell your oldest purchases because that's the easiest from a record keeping. But most you know, hedge funds or wealthy investors, they're going to use specific shares accounting where they're selling the most expensive Apple shares that they bought. Or if they have a specific intention, like they want to harvest a gain so they can use a loss they had somewhere else. You know, they, they basically customize the tax, the accounting to fit their tax situation. And we're trying to democratize that basically at Token Tax. I don't know if some people are misinformed, but... I feel like I do hear people saying, nah, for some reason, cryptocurrency has to be first in, first out. I mean, are you familiar with people who argue that? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, as, you, as we were discussing earlier, the IRS hasn't issued any guidance about, about nearly anything in the space. So, you know, going back to their last issuance in 2014. So basically, we're just trying to use common sense and be conservative, but also be consistent. So, you know, if you have... And consistency is like there are dozens of forks that have occurred on major coins. So if you're going to report one of the fo- like do it consistently. And and if and conservatism, you know, you use common sense of what what will be allowed. Like is, you know, if you trade Bitcoin to Litecoin, I've heard of accountants writing tax opinion letters that are like, "Oh, well that's a collectible coin." So, you know, the IRS allowed like kind exchange for collectible coins. So if you traded a silver dollar for like another silver dollar and it had appreciated a lot, you don't have to pay taxes on that till you sell the second silver dollar and stuff like that. And to me, that that's a bit of a stretch. But um, again, it's everyone has their own opinion. You just try to get to consensus. But as for specific shares accounting, FIFO, LIFO, um, securities are allowed to use that accounting and use specific shares accounting. And everything that SEC has been saying for the past few months about ICOs are really like IPOs, they're really capital raises, they need to be regulated as such. They're basically looking at cryptocurrency as a security. You know, the G20 is meeting right right now in South America, and that's the news coming out of theirs. Like, they're coming to a consensus that it is not a currency, that that's a misnomer. And I think it was the representative of Germany said that, or, or some country in Europe, because it's not. It's... It's an asset, and it's it's like a security. It's being issued to the public, and they're going to regulate it as such. And so we think that it's very rational and reasonable that it follows that the accounting treatments would be the same. Um, and like especially when you look at FIFO and LIFO, 
a lot of investors in crypto, they will buy, they, say they bought Bitcoin and they bought it a while ago, and then they decide they want to buy some new, some new altcoin like NEO. Well, they'll buy some fresh Bitcoin in their Coinbase account or whatever, transfer it over to Binance, buy NEO. And so to me, LIFO, if anything, is a much more realistic point of view of what's happening from an economic perspective um, as compared to FIFO. And so, but anyone who says that FIFO has to be used is just, is just speculating based on like no guidance from the IRS. I don't, I don't really know where that comes from. Okay. So would it be safe to say that's more conservative, but you, I guess you'd think it's way overboard conservative. <laughs> yeah. Like common sense is, is the, is the most important thing. But you know, if given the choice between all things being equal from a common sense perspective, then sure. Conservatives makes sense. And and consistency, but it's it's just a hierarchy. Like, think about like wash sales. I, I've seen a lot of stuff from accountants or from people saying, "Oh, wash sale rules don't apply because they're not technically securities or whatever." And to me, oh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if your users are familiar with wash sales, but what it means is if I own Bitcoin right now and I bought it for twenty thousand and now it's trading at eight thousand, I own one Bitcoin. I could sell it and then I rep- rec- recognize a twelve thousand dollar loss. And uh, two seconds later, I buy it back. So my economic position is basically exactly the same. But now I, I have a, t- a $12,000 realized loss. So you're not allowed to do this with stocks and securities and bonds, any type of investment like that. So it's safe to assume in my mind that for cryptocurrency, it would be the same, treated the same way. So, you know, we are conservative, more conservative in some areas than a lot of other people, but it's, it's about common sense. Like, are these securities? Basically they are, that's the closest proxy we have. So, you know, from an accounting perspective, that's has positives and negatives. So let's be reasonable about it and use common sense. Sure. And I guess I should also say that my, my interview back in 2015, I believe he also wasn't, uh, pushing the, the, gosh, I always forget FIFO, FIFO, FIFO. Yeah, either one. FIFO. FIFO. Oh, okay. Yeah. He 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 also thought you should save money and not use FIFO. So you're hardly alone, but um it's a totally fair question. I mean, we we get that question every day. And we're trying to make life as easy as possible for our tax filers too. So if the IRS comes down and you know, they're like, "Oh, well, retroactively, we're going to say you you can only use LIFO or FIFO." Well, we have all of we have that cachet. We can just print out a new 8949 for our users and automate the process of refiling. And we're basically preparing for anything the IRS might do. Um, and we're trying to put out white papers and content marketing and blog posts just to be thought leaders in the space and give the IRS our best thoughts and consensus and talking to crypto tax accountants and tax ec- crypto tax experts um, and just give them as much info as we can for them setting policy. Like I would love for them to have set policy in the past so we could just work around that and work with that. But since we don't have that, we're trying our best to sort of create it. And I've got lots of other general crypto accounting questions, but want to talk talk a bit more about token tax. Um, it seems like an enormous undertaking to just to set up the software. Um, can, can you talk about how setting up everything was for token tax? Uh, yeah, it, would, it definitely was an enormous undertaking. Um, like I mentioned earlier, my background is finance, accounting, business. And so my partner luckily is a great engineer. So we, we team programmed and, uh, we hired several engineers who are working for us on a contractor basis. Now our team is more than 10 people. Um, we've scaled up the accounting side. We have several full-time engineers. Um, and it all came together, you know, relatively recently Just start, like I had said, I, I had been working in crypto investing and tax and trying to do that on a consulting basis since last year for more than a year. But, um, and this tool had been getting developed in parallel, but we teamed up on it and, and got it to market as quickly as possible before tax season. So we just launched about a month ago on product hunt and it had won product hunt, you know, the, the global hackathon. So, um, people wanted this tool and like basically, Creating token tax was a crazy rush, and because of tax season and trying to get it out, while I mentioned you know the perfect storm of 2017 taxes, I, I knew that this was the year to get our tool out there and get a user base. So yeah, it was a pretty crazy push for a couple of months there. Uh, both Alex, my partner, and my 
my girlfriend have been amazingly understanding, but we we're on thin ice for a little while there. But uh, we're just glad the tool's out in the market and helping people every day have more than a thousand users now. And are there still like little stressful issues you guys are having to deal with or is it going pretty smooth now? Oh, it's startup life. So there's always something going on. But, um, you know, now, now most of the issues are just like, oh, the user interface is weird or this is weird. You know, we, our, our main focus, our engineering focus is making sure that the algorithm is perfect, the data output is perfect, and um, just that people are filing the most accurate and correct taxes possible. Um, but yeah, like everything in, in startup world, it seems like there's something interesting and fun every day, but like, oh, potential partnership here, or, oh, this user, you know, likes it so much that they want to talk about investing or this or that. But um, there are definitely downsides too, where, you know, it's Saturday night and the server is not responding or whatever, and it's two in the morning and everyone, all the engineers are, are huddling together trying to figure it out. So we've had we've had moments like that too, just to give you a preview of how the sausage is made. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, again, that that one listener seemed to like your service, so, so that was something. That's great. Yeah. So I noticed you guys. It's kind of an interesting setup where you have three price options. One's pretty cheap. Can you talk about more about how in depth you get with the I guess the different plans and? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have three different plans. We have basic, unlimited, and VIP. At a very high level, basic is thirty dollars. It includes automate API connection to GDAX and Coinbase typically. Um, and then the jump up to unlimited is two unlimited is $200 and that includes unlimited exchanges, wallets. So we support integration with whatever exchange. Some, some exchanges don't have API or CSV connection. So we have our own manual tools to get those transactions. Um, and we support wallet exports and basically anything you could want. And then VIP is, like unlimited, so you have connection, you can have as many trades and as many exchanges as you want, but also like those advisor sessions, it's more for people who have a situation where, oh, 12 of us got together and we were investing in a bunch of different ICOs and different things together and now we have a really complicated tax situation. Or for people who want to do more forward-looking tax planning, so we will look at the dashboard of all the coins they own today and sort of lay out, all right, well, these coins will turn into long-term gains at, you know, in March and these will in June and these will be in, in November. And we talk about, talk with them about their plans for investing in the future. And they might say, Oh, I want to, I want to buy this ICO, participate in this ICO. So we say, all right, well, from a tax perspective, the best way to do that is like move these coins here, buy new Ethereum. Um, so we do a lot of, a lot of very complex tax situations, I guess you could say, for VIP. People who have been hacked, had their coins stolen. And you know, the metric that we track is basically we, we try to save our customers more money or reduce their 2017 tax liability more than the cost of our service. And based on our metrics so far, 96% of our users, I think, are, fall in that category. Where it, you know, some people say it's too expensive, but if... You know, in our mind, it pays for our, pays for itself. Even if you use another service, um, if we can reduce your 2017 tax liability by that amount, help you turn that into long-term gain over the long run, we're we're literally putting money in your pocket. And you know, we've had users reduce their liability by five hundred thousand dollars, eight hundred thousand dollars, three hundred thousand um, dollars. So yeah, we're we're creating a lot of value for our users, basically. But but yeah, different people have different ideas on the price points and. In the future, we'd love to have more services that are that are more automated and just democratizing this at a cheaper price point. Would they possibly be talking to you? Well, it depends on it depends on the situation. But yeah, it, a lot of times it would be me. Glenn on our team is a CPA, has specific tax event, and or we'll call in third parties. And that's why it's so expensive as well because you know we have to pay <laughs> we have to pay them sometimes. But to be honest, we, VIP isn't really to make money. It's more just to deal with interesting tax situations and develop amazing relationships with customers that hopefully grow over the long run. As we expand our product offering, um, there's so many tools and different things that we would love to create with token tax over the long run. And so, yeah, that was kind of the mentality. And as you can see, that doesn't really scale that well when you're spending a lot of extra time on these complicated tax situations, but we're hopefully building in a core user base of very invested people who love the service. 
if someone had been using another platform, have you guys looked at ways someone could export all their cost basis and everything and import it into your system? Yeah, for sure. All the services are outputting to CSV or JSON. So it's not a crazy feat of engineering to restructure the columns. And, you know, we're basically dealing with that every single day from all the exchanges. Every exchange needs their own custom automatic import, but they're all CSV files. It's basically like which column is which. And it takes a lot of time on upfront to make sure that you're tagging the right thing and not mixing up buy and sell, for example. But, um, and it's the same for us, you know, our, our system outputs and people could test our, our data against other systems as well. And we're, you know, we're confident that no one's using the tax minimization logic that we're using, especially the break even between long-term capital gain rate and short-term capital gain rate, just because that was a, it was a big feat of programming to get that all, to get that all built. And so, um, you know, we have, we have plenty of customers who are like, Oh, I tried, I tried your service and I, I'm going to check some, some other service and, you know, if it's only 30 bucks or 40 bucks, like why not? If you made $10,000 in gains last year, or $2,000 in gains, it pays for itself to just explore what's out there from an accounting perspective. And, and um, we love user feedback when they say, oh, this one's easier to use for whatever reason, or this one provides a lot more information. You know, we, we get user feedback. I don't know if anyone's used our system that, oh, it's, it doesn't display that much. Like I don't see all my transactions, all my buys. Because what we're focused on for 2017 is just showing people taxable output. So if they look at their dashboard, it's just the things that get reported to the IRS. And the rest of everything that they've bought and all the other transactions is kind of under the hood, which they can get if they want um, for their own record keeping or whatever. But we're just trying to make sure that people don't report the wrong thing to the IRS. That's our primary error avoidance goal. Gotcha. So you're talking about consistency as far as the accounting method. If someone's been using your method or using FIFO, FIFO, <laughs> um, yeah, is it easy to switch from year to year from one method to another? That's where the specific shares comes into play. Like if you're using specific shares, it's always like everything is specific shares. So FIFO is specific shares. It's just shares that have older dates. LIFO is specific shares. So our methodology isn't isn't anything special. It's just the algorithm figures out which shares are the optimal shares to sell to minimize your taxes. That, that's why for this, for this year. And like to what we said earlier, you're really deferring the taxes into the future. It's not like you're, you're not going to eventually pay tax, but you're going to pay taxes at a lower rate because it's going to turn these, these gains are going to turn into long-term gains. So, you know, the IRS always, always gets their, their cut someday, but you know, our, our goal is that that day isn't today. And especially when you see what happened at the beginning of 2018, we had, we, you know, if a user made a lot of money in 2017 and was trading frequently, let's say they made a million dollars in gains, they might owe the IRS $500,000. And then that's when Bitcoin's at 19,000. Now it's at 8,000 for, for many users, they, they might owe the IRS more money than they actually, than their crypto is actually worth. And it's not like they can go back in time and refile their 2017 returns. They still owe the IRS that money. And hopefully, hopefully crypto isn't going to keep falling. But if it did, it would be even more difficult. So, you know, our tax system is about basically trying to figure out what's the best, be consistent from like a economic reality point of view. And as opposed to just FIFA, which is because of the way Bitcoin and crypto went up in value so much, you're paying a ton in taxes. But does it make sense to pay more in taxes than all of your crypto holdings are worth? Um, I don't think so. That's why we think that IRS will be fine with with our accounting methodology. Okay. And I, I do want to get back to that because I did see some things on Reddit from people just just uh, devastated by how much taxes they owed and uh. how, how they're, you know, people who had a lot of alts, I mean, really got hit with this pullback. So yeah. I guess in my question about changing methods, if you'd been doing one method and another, yeah, even though I guess maybe it's not really delineated like I'm thinking of it. From a record-keeping perspective, it's not that big of a deal because you just see what's left as your, I guess, starting positions for the year, no matter what you've done in the past, and you could use whatever method going forward. Is that basically correct? Yeah, for an individual investor, it's not anything too onerous. But I mean, a lot of that, the consistency and methodology, that's, that's when you talk about Walmart, when you talk about a big business, they're not allowed to do... FIFO one year and then LIFO another because of various 
ways they can game accounting by doing that. Like there are a bunch of accounting shenanigans that companies can do, which is why this, which is where that sort of comes from. Like you have to be consistent. You can't change methodologies. Um, in my mind, that's like the common sense understanding of it from, from studying accounting, having a degree in accounting. So let me ask you this on your platform. I guess if you've just imported a spreadsheet file or a API and say it's you, you can see you've sent, you know, Bitcoin somewhere, but I guess your software wouldn't know if you just spent it on something or if you transferred it to a, just another wallet. So is there some point after you import stuff, it asks you to enter more data on that or, or how does that work? To your point specifically with transfers, they are taxable events if you are paying someone, for example, or buying something. So that's as if you sold Bitcoin. So basically when you have transfers, um, we ask for more information. The opposite of what Coinbase is doing. What Coinbase is doing is they're saying for these 1099s that they're sending their users, they're saying every transfer is a taxable event. And then the burden is on their users to say that the IRS is someday going to send them a letter saying, oh, but you know, Coinbase told me you made these 10 transfers and we never got our, our capital gains from the appreciation between when you bought it and when you transferred it out. And it's going to be on the burdens on the user to then tell the IRS, no, I transferred it to my, my hardware wallet, all the Bitcoins here, or I transferred it to Binance and then I reported all my trades on Binance here. And so basically that's what the VIP does. We offer IRS assistance and it's for informational requests like that just to make it as easy and painless as possible. Or if they get audited for crypto reasons, we will basically give them as much help, finding information, whatever that they need for them to interact with the IRS and make it as painless as possible, if that makes sense. But yeah, like any transfers or a lot of incoming Bitcoin, those are as if you bought it. So if you, a lot of people get paid in Bitcoin. So that has two, a two prong tax result. So Every time they receive the Bitcoin, that needs to be reported as income on their, on their Schedule C, like self-employment income. But then for our purposes, calculating capital gains and losses, it's as if they bought a Bitcoin that day. So if they got paid a Bitcoin every Friday, then it's worth $1,000. They recognize $1,000 in income on their self-employment, and then they'll have expenses to offset against that. You know, we have a reporter who has a situation like this where she's always paid in, in Bitcoin, and then... Um, but then when she eventually sells that Bitcoin, we use the cost basis that's determined the day she received it when she theoretically bought it because she would have been paid us dollars and said she was paid Bitcoin. Um, and so our software does all of that automatically, but that's more of the, more of a complicated tax situation. I was glad to hear you said when it, so transfer and it's vague, you guys will actually ask if it was a spend or a transfer. And I, I guess, is it the same way with money coming into a wallet, it, you would ask, was that income or a transfer? Or? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, that's that sounds perfect. So I've got uh, a question that uh, I'd assume anyone kind of who's been involved with the Let's Talk Bitcoin network, um, a question I would assume many would have. I don't know if people think about taxes like I do. I, I feel pretty unique. Um, and I guess maybe I'll even ask you, there's always that I don't know if it's a rumor or truth that 800 people filed crypto taxes between 2013 and 2015. Are you familiar with that? Oh, yeah. Do you believe that to be true? Uh, I mean, to be honest, just from talking to accountants and who have been filing users' taxes since then, I've heard of enough people who say, oh, for sure, it's been much higher than that. Like, I alone did 300 or whatever, that I feel like it's very unlikely that it's true. Okay. I mean, in, I in my think opinion. So. Okay. Yeah. But, and like, they probably wouldn't know, you know, 89, 49, it just looks like you're investing in different, you know, anything in any type of security and any type of investment. Um, so I don't know how the IRS would really know which ones are cryptocurrency specific or not, or where that 800 came from. But what do you think? You think it's true? I didn't think so either. I thought I can't be that much of a unicorn kind of a, you know, rare bird, you know. I mean, I know I am in some ways, <laughs> but I didn't think I was that that odd. Anyway, uh, so I wanted to get back to the question. Um, I'm going to kind of spell out what happened with the Let's Talk Bitcoin network and see if you have an opinion. And because I, I think the listeners would, would be curious or, or other podcasters. Um, back in around 2014, Let's Talk Bitcoin Networks, Adam Levine created a really cool system and created a specific token on Counterparty. It was called LTB Coin. 
And this was used kind of in the ecosystem where content creators would get paid with this and listeners would get little rewards if they showed they listened to stuff. And they're just a kind of a, a neat token and it had a emission curve and everything. And it, it seemed to work really well at first, but eventually it just seemed like the coin kind of faded away. And then uh, counterparty um, transactions got really expensive because it uses Bitcoin transactions and uh, – it just, I don't know, I, I don't know where they were on the emission curve, if they were basically at the end or if they just had to stop because it got too expensive to do all these distributions and stuff. Um, so we got to a point where LTB coin really wasn't trading anywhere. And, you know, I don't know if it really had any value. And then Let's Talk Bitcoin made a deal where they were acquired by BTC Media. And uh, my sense is Adam wanted to make sure everyone who was holding LTB coin got something for it. So there was a deal where people could send in their LTB coin. And in exchange for that, they would get this new ICO that BTC Medium was involved in. Uh, it's called Poet. And so basically, you send in your LTB coins. And then I don't know if it was weeks or, or so later, you receive Poet tokens. All these people who did this, including me, like I have no idea what to call that as far as my taxes go. Do you have an opinion? So you received LTB coins back in 2014, 2015, back in the day. Is that accurate? Yeah, through through 2017, even the beginning of 2017. And you just got it for activity? For me, I was a content creator. So, I mean, I, I counted it as income. Yeah. And it was, it was easy to exchange and convert to fiat. I mean, relatively easy or possible, I should say. I'd say most of that span, you know, not at the very beginning or the very end, it was on at least one exchange. And they also have, it's kind of neat, a decentralized exchange, the whole counterparty platform. So you can theoretically kind of have a trustless uh, exchange. So you can always exchange counterparty things. But I don't know if people use that as a price source or if there's any volume there. Got it. Um, well, yeah, just off the top of my head, the way I would do it is, sounds like you did it right, where especially as a content creator, you're not just like, I was on their website and they sent me this thing. I could see someone who's just a user saying, I don't even know how to turn this into dollars. Like it's not income from a, you know, from a reasonable perspective. But for you, you got the coins, you registered that as income. So that would become the cost basis of your coins. So let's just say you got a thousand dollars worth of coins, market value the day you got them. That's your cost basis. Had you sold it, that's what you would report to the IRS's cost basis. But so, let's say since you didn't sell it, um, eventually when you get the poet coins, the cost basis transfers to the poet coins. So if you got 500 poet coins, and sorry to do so much mental math over there, but 500 poet coins, and your old cost basis was $1,000, so all your new poet coins would have a cost basis of $2, basically. So the cost basis, in my mind, would transfer to the new coins. It's almost like a, like a, a stock split. And so the actual conversion from this one coin to the other, you wouldn't see as a taxable event? No, because it was involuntary, right? It wasn't like you went and bought it. It's just that because you have this coin, they sent you a new one. It, it's like a stock split in my mind. And I, I feel the same way about coins that pay inflation or whatever. It's like, well, basically the, the, the value of the coin collectively, all the NEO out there, it's still worth exactly the same. They just issued another 1%. So all the coins you had before were, are worth slightly less, and your extra 1% makes it so that you're, you know, nothing happened from an economic perspective. Um, but then someday when you sell the Poet coin, you'd recognize a gain relative to the $1,000 cost basis. Yeah, it makes sense. The cost basis of, of the original coins would be the cost basis for the, the new coin. But um, hopefully that, that's good news to, to anyone who went through that process. <laughs> yeah. So if we were on um, token tax... Is there a process for uh, like assigning, like I guess it's not just the cost basis, but maybe the the holding period too, right? If it would be from the original? Yeah, exactly. Is there a way you would signify this using your platform? Yeah, absolutely. We have a, we try to make it as simple as to use as possible. So we have a spreadsheet and it has five columns that we need, which is the date you received whatever. In this case, the date you received the initial coin, how many of those coin you got, and what's the symbol? And then, you know, if you knew the US dollar value at that time, put that in. Or if you don't, you upload it into our system. Our system can query a historic pricing database and we know the US dollar value. And then we have logic in there where if you said it was worth a million dollars and we query the database and it's like, no, this was only worth a hundred dollars. Did you make a mistake? 
So we have a lot of you know automated error checking functionality built in for things like that, especially for our manual imports. And then that would appear in your dashboard, or that would appear in your database as a buy. And then someday when you sold Poetcoin, just make sure we have that those coins are the same, so we use the price of Poetcoin, but the cost basis of, of LTB coin. And it would all be automated for you, yeah. I guess my question is, what is the mechanism to link those two? Uh, well, if we have any user who has this situation and we have a lot of the common rebrands and everything, that's all coded together in our historic pricing. But basically what would happen is if we didn't have it, um, it would be easily caught because when you eventually sold Poetcoin, uh, the worst case scenario, what it would say, is there we, we can't find any sufficient buy for this, so your cost basis is zero. And it would put a little red warning sign and say, reach out to us so we can figure it out. And then you'd tell me the situation, and I'd say, oh, okay. So we know the market value. We just have to see what LCB coin was when you got it. We know the cost basis, and we'd handle it in that way. Um, and you get the spreadsheet, and you just enter the data you have, basically. And it's all, it's all automated on our site. You download the spreadsheet, you put it in. One of the crypto tax experts take a look at it if there's any issues. Um, and, and we try to give all, you know, a look at every single one of our users' dashboards before it's deployed for anything they've uploaded manually just to make sure that nothing gets reported incorrectly. Cool. Ben, I hope you guys can scale that if you get really big. <laughs> yeah. But I love, I love all the alerts when things aren't quite right because that's something my, my current platform that I've been using doesn't do. And I find I'm just looking at all these charts of stuff, looking for things that don't look right because yeah. a lot of times things are just zero because maybe it couldn't find a price feed. And I was like, well, no, I, I don't know about that. So I guess, let me ask you this. How do you guys get all your price feeds um, for so many cryptocurrencies that have come and gone? Basically, we've contracted with third parties who have who have built these these historic pricing APIs and pay them a license fee and just build it ourselves now going forward from, um, you know, what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. But yeah, a lot of it, again, like, like I said, it was a big engineering feat back to make sure that we had everything. And a lot of it is just when we're testing this, we'll import a coin and it'll be like, Oh, the price for that coin doesn't exist. Oh, okay. That rebranded. And you know, a lot of our team have been investing for years in crypto. So they just, they know about all these rebrands and they've, they've lived it. So they, you know, it's, it's obvious to them right away, like what happened. After a couple of edge cases, the whole team is pretty much up to speed on that, on those type of things. I've been putting out the Bitcoin game since 2014, and I've managed to avoid accepting any ads for scammy ICOs or software that steals your Bitcoin. Instead, I've been able to stick to products with a track record like the world-famous Bitcoin keychain from btckeychain.com. These keychains have been around almost five years, and they've appeared over a thousand times on blogs and news sites, photographically representing the topic of Bitcoin. You'll see these keychains on sites as diverse as The Guardian and Infowars. The maker of these keychains also offers Litecoin keychains and Bitcoin fork pens. Go to btckeychain.com to learn more about the keychains or bitcoinnovelties.com to check out these Bitcoin novelty items on amazon.com where you can take advantage of free Amazon Prime shipping in the USA. You can also find the Bitcoin keychains on Open Bazaar. If you have a totally legit product or service and you'd like to be a sponsor on this podcast or a wealth of other cryptocurrency podcasts and media outlets, it's easy to find out more. Just email dave at btcmedia.org and tell him Rob from the Bitcoin game sent you. And I think this is back to a basic question, but basically if you gift someone some cryptocurrency, that's not a, a tax event for you, I guess, unless it's over your yearly gift amount, then that's some kind of a tax event, I guess. But whoever you give it to, they're theoretically supposed to use your cost basis if they sell it. Is that correct? Yep, that's exactly right. Is there anything else about giving gifts of cryptocurrency you think is something to pay attention to? Well, there's the rules around the lifetime allowable for for family members and parents, and you have... We've had situations with clients where like their parents had given them money for a down payment on, on, a, on a condo and then you're getting close to those lifetime caps. Um, that probably won't be relevant for too many people, but um, 
But no, just just to report it. Like you, you can't just give, you can't just uh, receive a big gift, and then nothing ever gets said told to the IRS. And the same thing with people who are doing 1031 exchanges, which, like I said, I don't think is a good idea. And I think you know, the IRS has made it pretty clear with their new rules about 2018 that they just they're making it just real property, real estate, and and I think they're going to retroactively probably disallow that. But um, either way. If you're doing a 1031 exchange, you have to tell the IRS that. You can't just be like, oh, I did a 1031 exchange, so I didn't tell you anything. And I, I'm really worried for a lot of people that they don't understand that and they're just doing that. That's not going to fly with IRS. So that, that's a PSA for, for your users. So that's the like-kind exchange? Or? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And have you ever heard an account or anyone think that's a good idea? Oh, sure. There, I mean, there are websites like we, oh, we do 1031 exchange and... You know, if, if I'm doing a 1031 exchange, photo, photo, like a print screen that website and say where you got your info so that, you know, you can show the IRS, I made my best faith effort to pay my taxes, to report everything. Like there was no guidance. I, and at least that way, hopefully you can avoid any penalties. I mean, we're all just trying to do the best we can with the info we have. But um, so just over document. That's what I would say. OK, you definitely don't just think you did those exchanges without filing the paperwork and expect that to sneak by, I guess, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of people don't understand that. And why would you if you're not an accountant, you know, or not like deep into crypto taxes? So. Well, I'm worried some people just maybe hear an accountant say that and they don't realize they still have to file all this paperwork to make that happen. So, or to try, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, talking about giving cryptocurrency, um, are there advantages in donating cryptocurrency? Well, in 2018 now, they've changed the rules around donating anything in general. So it's harder to get a deduction for that. So that's worth noting. But yeah, I mean, I've noticed that, uh, I think it was Fidelity, they've started a new program where people can donate large amounts of crypto and it's managed kind of like a large a large nonprofit fund. Um, I guess advantages are <laughs> you can pay, pay it forward if you had massive wealth creation that you didn't expect, you can pay it forward. Um, from a tax perspective, it would be the same as donating anything else, just from you not having to recognize income on it. Um, and then you could get into the ethics of, oh, Mark Zuckerberg gave 70 billion or whatever, 50 billion worth of Facebook stock to a, to a foundation he controls. So should that really be a taxable event? Like now he can spend the money without ever paying taxes on it. Um, so there's the same ethical issues with, with donating large amounts of crypto. So I guess I would say it's a very gray area, but I'm always for donating, uh, to, especially to support new ICOs and new entrepreneurs in the space who are legit and trying to build great businesses so crypto can actually thrive and become a long-term mainstay. You're giving me all this moral stuff. I just want your tax advice. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, from a tax perspective, I guess it's, it would be better to donate crypto than to sell it and donate the proceeds. Yeah, then they inherit your basis. The same thing as like donating art, the same thing is as donating anything that's appreciated in value. And and again, like they've changed the rules now, so I think there are some taxes on certain amounts of appreciation or it depends who you're giving the the crypto to. Like you can't just create your own nonprofit and give it to even though Mark Zuckerberg did that. Uh, there are like a lot of paperwork hurdles because you know, they don't want people structuring something. And then from an economic perspective, it's the same thing as you owning it, but you never paid tax on it, Type that type of thing. And on the, the whole gifting of uh, cryptocurrency, is it 14000 like the limit until you have to start dealing with gift tax issues and stuff? Is that the yearly limit? To one person? Yeah, from one person to another. For uh, 2017, yeah, 14000 So, you know, if you... and. It depends. Like, be realistic about the economic reality of it. Like, a lot of people put their money in a wallet, and they were investing together. And I've I've heard stories like, oh, we're gonna structure it like they gifted it to me, and then I'm gonna pay the tax. And but like, just do what's the economic reality. I would say, which is, it was always their money, and make them file their own 8949, showing the gains and losses. Um, I think it's risky to start structuring gifts back and forth if that's not really what happened. But a lot of people have gifted crypto to their family members, and that's totally legit. Just make sure you report it, and the family member will inherit the basis of, of what you gave them. So does token tax, if you classify something as a gift, will it give you a little note what the cost basis you should pass along would be? Yeah, I mean, that would be done as a VIP one-off 
but yeah, like we, we've done that for some users where it's like, oh, I gave this to my dad, I gave this to my friend. And basically, each of them get an account created and we know how to flow the cost basis from one to the other. So if you were gifting, for your perspective, it would make sense to use the the cheapest uh, uh, buy, I guess, to, to get rid of that high uh, gain you have. Is that is that true? Would your well, software do that? <laughs> I mean, either way, it wouldn't matter because they aren't selling it. But yeah, I mean, I think realistically what you want to do is if you're if you're giving some crypto to your sister well give her the one you paid the most for so that she doesn't have to pay a crazy gain when she sells it so you know give her the bitcoin that you bought for fifteen thousand dollars not the one you bought for 500 so almost the opposite of like what i said yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, so what would um token tax do do you think if something's marked as a gift what do you think it tries to do what is token tax do? yeah because normally you'd probably be trying to minimize your taxes and i guess you know, if you could donate your cheapest coins, that would lower your future gains if you realize them. So I was just curious, which coins would token taxes algorithm choose to sell if you were giving a gift? Well, I guess it would be totally user dependent. Like, you know, the economic value of the gift you're giving is is directly proportional to the cost basis of it. So, you know, you, if you give someone 20,000 of Bitcoin, but the cost basis is 2,000, well, or sorry, 10,000, but the cost basis is 2,000, you're really giving them... 10,000 minus 8,000 times their marginal tax rate if they sell it. So you got to think about how big of a gift you want to give. That is so interesting. I just never sense. thought about it that way. <laughs> oh, it makes total sense that, yeah, whatever cost basis you assign to that is really going to affect whoever you give it to if and when they sell it. And I guess I was talking how it would affect yourself too. <laughs> yeah. Um, with the big Bitcoin fork in 2017, I, I feel like at first I started seeing some articles saying, hey, this is uh, this, like a distribution or something, or and you, it's a taxable event. you got to report the Bitcoin cash you own. But now it seems like kind of the consensus has kind of changed where, hey, it's not a taxable event, but when you spend it, you just have to use your zero cost basis. Uh, what's your view on it? This is like the most hotly, one of the most hotly debated topics among crypto tax accountants and experts, whatever. Um, I think it sort of depends on consistency versus conservatism versus economic reality. Um, you know, the, there have been so many forks of Bitcoin, like Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Cat, a lot of other Bitcoin forks that people don't even know about. So I sort of find it inconsistent if people are reporting income on Bitcoin Cash, but not on the other ones. Um, that's So that's one point. But, you know, basically we're giving the optionality to the user and every user has had a different situation. Like some of them, kept their Bitcoin in a random wallet, and they don't even know how to recover the Bitcoin cash. Sure, sure. Yeah, so for those users, they never got anything. So I find I, I think it's totally inaccurate to report income of Bitcoin cash of $266 on the day of the fork that, that you never got. Um, and then for people in Coinbase, they didn't get access to it for months. And so basically what I would say is we're recommending one of two options. The first one, like you said, Take a cost basis of zero, just like you've taken with all of your forks. And it's like a stock split. Again, your one share of Apple split into 10 shares of apples, like, and treat it like that. Or you can treat it as you got economic value at that time, recognize income of $266, and that becomes your cost basis. Or a third method, which is like more complicated, is you just allocate part of the basis from your Bitcoin, pay some appreciation, like, oh, I sold a tenth of a Bitcoin, so I owe some capital gains on that. I mean, people, depending on how much they know about accounting, have their own little twists of what they like to do. But we just say, like, make your best faith effort to pay the IRS what's fair and what represents what economically really happened to you. So I, I started thinking about some of the subtleties of this and you know, talking to people on Twitter, you know, other non-accountants. And um, just started thinking about if you, you know, things like Trezor, different wallets had tools to separate your BCH and your BTC. And I was wondering, is would the act of separating them kind of indicate you've accepted it and thus means you should pay some kind of tax on that? Well, this is like what I said, like just the U.S. legal system and accounting system is just so into technicalities that it's when there's no official, really difficult worded FASB or whatever, or IRS declaration, I try to just use common sense. But yeah, I mean, I guess you could say when you went through the process of receiving it. But, you know, why would that be any different than, oh, I moved five shares of 
Apple into another account or for whatever reason, you know, it's like your economic value didn't really change on that day. It's just now in a different format, in my opinion. So I would say that you're still fine recognizing um, the Bitcoin cash as having zero cost basis and paying the full amount of tax when you sell. Um, because otherwise you're kind of getting penalized calling it income, paying short-term gain when you're trying to be responsible as an investor and hold everything until it gets long-term treatment. And like the IRS tax code incentivizes long-term holding for a reason. So I just feel like it, it's not economically accurate to force people to pay income tax on, on a Bitcoin cash fork. So to sum it up, you're saying if, if someone did take the steps to separate it, which basically means I think sending both your BTC and BCH to new addresses that are now separated, that, that doesn't make it more of a, a tax event to you. It doesn't make it more of a tax event to me. I mean, I think it's the same as a tax event of if you had Neo and you know every week or whatever, every month you get Neo gas. So you started with a thousand Neo and four years later it's grown to 1100 Neo. And I know it's a different, it's actually gas, but so say it isn't. And, and so it's actually very similar to this where like you had Bitcoin, now you have Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash. And you could send them separately, but you haven't, your economic value situation hasn't changed. It's just like almost they inflated away some of the value of Bitcoin into the other, into the other asset. And you had no, you had no say in it. You know, it's one thing, and that's why every user is different. Like if you are one of the people pushing the Bitcoin fork and you have millions of dollars of Bitcoin cash, well, then that's probably a different situation than some random user who just has his, his Bitcoin in a treasure. And then six months later, he goes and figures out how to split it out and like go back and use my Ether wallet, whatever, to get access to the Bitcoin cash. Okay, except for the my ether wallet for Bitcoin <laughs> Sorry, cash yeah, part, yeah. but yeah, <laughs> no, no, no problem. Um, and Neo has gas. I don't know anything about Neo. Yeah, Is that was that an accurate? It's thing just you're yeah, yeah, exactly. It's another one that's hotly debated in the crypto community because it basically pays a, it basically every and like Stellar Lumens, they they give inflation tokens. So every Monday, Stellar gives you point zero one percent of the amount of Stellar you have. But like, did anything change for Stellar, or is it, it's really just like uh, nine hundred nine, like a nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine for ten thousand stock split, in my opinion, like from a common sense perspective, if that makes sense. And Neo is doing the same thing, where they basically give you new tokens just for holding the coin on a re regular basis. Gotcha. If we do take someone who maybe even with your advanced algorithm just has so much gains uh, in 2017 and really isn't sure they could could pay the taxes due. I mean, do you have suggestions for someone like that? And now the value has dropped a lot? Yeah. So right now, you know, if they're filing their taxes, you know, they're like, oh my God, I, I don't have nearly enough to my net worth to pay the taxes due. You know, someone who was just completely, I guess, ignorant of, of the tax consequences and, and didn't, you know, know there would be this big dip. Well, one, hopefully plan for next time. So you could, you could put some of your crypto at salt lending or whatever and get a loan against it. This was something that we talked about with uh, people who had situations like that. Or, you know, I guess the IRS is understanding about these type of things. You go to them, explain the situation, say, you know, I owe you half a million dollars. And because of capital gains I got in 2017 from trading coin to coin, and now all my coins are worth 200000 I can sell it all for dollars and give it to you and, you know, make a settlement offer to the IRS and just be as transparent and open as possible. And this happened, this happened a lot in, uh, in the, the uh, internet bubble. And even in 2007, you, you, we, we actually have some clients who are still carrying forward tax losses from uh, the Y2K internet crash because wow. they lost so much. And, you know, it's 3000 per year plus all the gains they've had. Um, so, so for some of those people, they actually don't want tax minimization. They want to use FIFO or whatever to maximize taxes this year so they can kind of use up their, use up their lost carry forward. Um, and so you have interesting situations like that. But I mean, it would suck if you, if you owe the IRS a million dollars and then the next year you lose a million dollars, you have to carry that loss forward for $3,000 per year for you know, 330 years until you actually 
break even or start making more money in the future to have some gains to offset that. But it just seems a little bit punitive that our tax code works that way. But given that, you got to do the best you can. Hopefully those people made a lot of crypto gains and uh, they're finally realizing <laughs> those losses like against the gains, I guess. Yeah. Hey, th- now let me ask you this. This is, I don't know how many other people do this, but, um, you know, f- I have a small business and what I've always done, if people want to pay me in cryptocurrency and I will take that cryptocurrency personally and then pay my business U.S. dollars because I don't, I don't want my business holding cryptocurrency. It just seems cleaner that way. Is there anything you think wrong about doing it that way or anything I should do differently if I want to do it that way? Yeah. I mean, again, it comes down to technicalities versus common sense and, you know, all these rules about related inter, interrelated transaction or, inter, you know, do you own 100 percent of your business? Is it a flow through X, Y, Z? But basically, yeah, like as long as the dollars match up and you you personally are when you sell those crypto assets, you're reporting the gains on them as if you, it was your personal asset, I think it's totally fine. It's like people do a startup and you know, when they first start paying for stuff, if they haven't formed an LLC yet or whatever, they sometimes have to use their own, send cash out of their own bank account. And just, you got, just keep as good of records as you can and try to keep things as separate as you can. But common sense usually, hopefully ru- rules the day with the IRS, I hope. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I didn't know if there's any weird something weird about that that It's different if you're a big public company or you're just a guy doing a small business. Along those lines, I was just looking at Reddit. I just thought I'd throw this interesting idea out there, see if you have an opinion on it. <laughs> you ready? Sure. I'm just going to read this to you. Uh, it says, I currently have a sole, a sole proprietorship. I am considering converting to an LLC in order to use the lending features of Bitfinex because I guess I get better rates. Um, the LLC is a separate legal entity from me. So if I send BTC to the LLC for use in lending, will I need to pay capital gains for that BTC? It depends on the, uh, the way you were trading before. Like you don't actually have to form a sole proprietorship or file the paperwork or file, um, you know, to have it be a sole proprietorship, to have it be a business. So if you want to say that you've always been trading crypto as a business, Um, and now you're just formalizing the legal structure, then no, like transferring it from yourself to the LLC that you've now finally gotten around to creating, that shouldn't trigger a taxable event. But everyone's situation is is totally different. Like if if you've been spending it and X, Y, Z, and it's clear it's not, it wasn't just like a separate investing business that could be thought of as like an independent business, um, then maybe that's less clear. But also... When you, when you create an LLC, you can transfer property to it, and that's your contribution. And the rules around whether you have to recognize capital gains or not depend on what percentage of the LLC you own and X, Y, Z. But if you own 100% of that LLC, I don't think you need to recognize capital gains when you transfer it from yourself. Great. I, I thought it was an interesting question. Curious what you think. LLCs have advantages for other reasons. Not Like if your coins get stolen... That's in a business expense for an LLC, whereas now the same as the IRS changed the rules around donating money, they changed the rules around theft. So like if you get hacked and you lose all your coins and you don't, you're not trading in a business structure, you're actually screwed over from a deduction perspective compared to how it was last year. But if you create an LLC, you're better off. And that's another thing that, that like our v- VIP meetings are about. We help people who have a lot of money to protect set up situations like or set up structures like that or whatever. So you're saying that's something new for 2018, the change? Yeah, because it used to be de- deductible in excess of 2% of your AGI if you lost something, like even if you lost your bike or your car. And now they've changed that, gotten rid of that. Um, and they've also changed the rules around, like if you pay someone to manage your assets or you pay broker fees or something, that's not deductible anymore. Like they not only is crypto tax complicated, but they changed a lot of relevant tax related issues from 2017 to 2018. So I have a lot of sympathy for accountants who are scrambling around trying to do everything. If you're vulnerable to getting hacked or you have millions of dollars of crypto, probably you want to set up an LLC just in case. All right. Um, do you have any other thoughts about um, just the way people deal with their cryptocurrency, hold it, trade it? Any, any insights or observations? Uh, yeah, I mean, just be strategic, you know, don't just blindly like transfer whatever Bitcoin to, you know, just on a, oh, I want to buy this coin. I want to buy this new whatever coin. 
be try to be thoughtful about it and be like, all right, taxes will eat up a huge chunk of my appreciation if especially if you've been investing for a long time. So just there's so so much value that can be created by just being thoughtful about what you do. And it's that's like everything in your life, you know. Use a Chase Sapphire Reserve credit card. Get 4.5% back on dining and and travel. And I feel like that personal finance mantra, it it creates value in everything you do. Create a 401k. Try to invest. If you want to invest in crypto, do it through an IRA. You know, there are services that provide that. And then you don't have to worry about taxes if you structure it right. Um, so just like take a step back, think about your ultimate goal, and then think of the smartest financial way to do that. And yeah, and I mean, depending on how big you are, like, yeah, $629 is a lot for VIP. But if you have a big enough bag of, of crypto or money, it can pay for itself thousands of times over to use experts in this type of personal finance strategy. Gotcha. And, and I got to backtrack to one question I realized I didn't ask you. If you did decide to realize that, let's say, a forked coin is some kind of income rather than wait till you actually spend it, that wouldn't be on your normal forms that are generated for your cryptocurrency trades, I assume. That that would go somewhere different? Yeah. So the for, the income you recognize, that goes somewhere else on your tax return. So the the customers we have who want to do that, we just make sure they understand how to do that or they connect with their accountant to do that. But then the income they recognize, that becomes the cost basis of their Bitcoin cash in our system. As if they bought Bitcoin cash for $266 per, per BCH on that day in August or whatever, um, whenever they decided to do it. So that's just a, a manual transaction entry. Interesting. And do you guys ever offer to try to do someone's complete taxes? No, we don't do that. We'll we're looking into partnerships with uh, different um, accounting providers, and hopefully we'll get something worked out soon where we could basically give our customers uh, a discount on a service and hand off the ones who want completely hands-free, just here's all my crypto trades, here's my W-2, and uh, please file my taxes for me. But we don't do actual filing. We're, we're, you know, informational, help you calculate all of your gains and losses and even give you extra information if you're mining or if you're gifting or if you're recognizing forks. Try to answer any questions you have about crypto taxes, but you either need to file yourself or file with an accountant. And I think, you know, 90% 90, 90 of our users are filing with an accountant anyway. So, um, and that's not our business, basically. We're, we're crypto tax. Well, shoot, I'm pretty impressed with everything you've told me. Um, you know, without actually using your platform, and I've only used one other one, really, um, it's hard to compare and, and see what's best. But um, it sounds like you guys are pretty responsive and um, know what you're doing. And I, I, I like that you're hands on when people are having an issue, because I do know with some of these other platforms, sometimes it's hard to get help and uh, hard to figure out maybe how to do some of these more complicated transactions and stuff so yeah thank you so much yeah that was the vision that was the vision so we're hopefully making it a reality now great well let me know the website and any social media and anything else you'd like to give out the website is tokentax.us and we're on facebook at token tax we're on twitter at token tax probably most active on twitter you know telegram for the token tax on telegram so um yeah please check us out and thank you so much for having me on here um, really thoughtful questions. Really, definitely the, uh, such an in-depth podcast compared to yeah. some of the other one. I really appreciated it. Well, good luck with everything, Zach. You too. All Thanks right, take me. care. Bye. So what do you think? Did you have your complex tax questions answered? Do you think Zach was off base on anything he recommended? Either way, come visit this episode's show notes page and leave your question or comment. You'll find it at thebitcoingame.com or letstalkbitcoin.com. Just look for The Bitcoin Game. On the show notes page, you'll find various links and images related to each episode. And as far as token tax, while there are multiple services you can turn to for cryptocurrency tax assistance, token tax certainly seems to be one worth considering. If you want to try it out, you can get a 10% discount by entering BTC Game when you check out. Thanks for listening.